Hello and welcome to this special episode of Beyond the Bites. We are in Shillong, the picturesque pine city. Well, a favorite among tourists from across the country and beyond, Shillong unfortunately has been in the news for all the wrong reasons in the past one week. What triggered the tensions, we all know by now, so I am not going to get into that to start with. However, one thing is certain, the image of Shillong as an abode of peace has taken a hit due to the way reports have gone out from the place of disturbance over the past one week. So is Shillong all about the image that has been portrayed by a section of the media in the last one week, or is it the abode of peace and pluralism as it has been known over the years? To decode answers to these questions, I have with me a selected group of panelists, prominent citizens from Shillong today. To my left is Reverend PBM Basaimat, a human rights activist, a very welcome to be on the bite, sir. Thank you for being with us here today. I also have with me Mr. Nava Bhattacharji, an environmentalist, a columnist, and also the president of the Central Puja Committee in Shillong. To my left also is Ms. Agnes Khashing, the president of CSWO, also a rights activist. To my right, I have Ms. Mahua Sen, an artist and of course a concerned citizen here today. The man sitting next needs no introduction, Mr. R.G. Lingdo, former Home Minister and also a very concerned individual as far as Shillong is concerned. And I also have with me a musician, Kit Shang Fliang. He too needs no introduction in this forum. So I'll go straight to Reverend Basaimat to start with. Sir, it's, it's, it's been a week since the turmoil uh, happened. Uh, so, so can we safely say things are back to normal in Shillong or an uneasy calm still prevails? I cannot say because I stay in a locality which is not affected at all. And what you said has affected the whole of Shillong. I, I stay in a locality where curfew to us has no meaning at all. We just move around ev all the time. But it is a localized issue which perhaps through rumors and all that, which are spread here and there. And you know, rumors, sometimes 99% of the rumor becomes a fact. And these are some of the things which have to be, we have to try to contain. And uh, yesterday I was watching NDTV and I saw Kit. And you have your group, singing group, and then you start with the singing. So I think that's the, one of the issues is that the, the rumor is like, uh, you know, you cannot, uh, it spreads out. And I know stories on all how rumors, even how we are back in the 79, and they said that the, uh, the water reservoir at Malki was contaminated, poisoned. And uh, we went down, and then they came down to Maulai. I was thinking in Maulai. And then 4 o'clock in the morning, they said, hey, don't drink the water, don't drink the so, water. So, so basically, as of now, it's a very localized issue. Yeah, yeah. The entire Shillong has not been affected. Right. Uh, that's what Reverend Basimat feels. Uh, Mr. Bhattacharji, uh, this is not the first time uh, such an altercation took place in the affected area. But why do you think on this occasion, it went on to that extent that finally we had to call in the army. What, what, what could have happened? You see, there are various uh, parameters. And uh, for last uh, two decades or more, we had been relatively calm, peaceful. You see, these type of, uh, whether you say social or economic or whatever, happens all over the country and even over the, in all over the world. The reasons here, which I perceive, and <clears throat> being on the ground and visiting all over the state, it also has, besides the local issues, it also has the economic concern. You see, we cannot take a distorted uh, view that uh, it is only xenophobia. It has definitely been localized, but you should see what are, what, uh, are the intrinsic issues involved here? The settlement, let me come straight to the point. The settlement at this place, whatever it was, 100 years, 150 years, has been an issue. It's not a new issue. But again, you see, politics plays its role. We all know how it has played over the years in that area, and now too. 
the question is how we can come to an amicable solution it's it's pointless today we say that calm has returned after 20 years if we feel that we have somehow settled my time will pass and we'll see what happens after 10 years and that has been the approach you see we should take the bull by the horns and but 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 yeah. but, but uh miss kashin uh mobilization of hundreds within hours can we pretend that it did not become us versus they in moments time yes it has uh, it's very unfortunate yes that uh, the way uh, social media has helped in spreading such rumors that uh, that mobilization the people came out in such a way that uh, yes it has like become us versus them and you know at that time anyone can just uh, the defense also has to be there then the ones who are attacking has that notion that we have to take them out and I met a kid in the Negrim's hospital 18 years old I went to see those boys one was there at 6 o'clock I said why uh, what happened how did you reach there he said we were just told to get them out so our, I don't know what to say it is really very sad because Shillong has been uh, such a beautiful place accepting every community we live we want to live in harmony and we have been living in harmony and suddenly because of that tension what transpired we don't know yes government has to look into uh, deeply into this because we don't want a repetition of such uh, thing but uh, it was really unprecedented Mahua San, uh, born and brought up in Shillong, of course you are in Delhi now, but you know this uh, city in and out. Right. Uh, such kind of violence, if I may uh, term it, has, uh, has uh, probably flared up over two and a half decades later. I mean, we, we don't remember when was the last time a curfew was imposed in this kind of scenario. So it's, it's again concerning uh, being a, a, a concerned resident of Shillong. Uh, it, it does raise some concern. Well, uh, uh it brought out a lot of uh, memories and mixed emotions, you see, because absolutely because one has also while it started, say, in 1979 and the entire process, we were very young, right? So the constitution of our own landscape is is very uh, sort of it, it's these things are very intrinsic to how we developed our sense of the world or how we how we grew up. So one has also forgotten that and you know gone out in 15, 20 years, as you say, we have not really had uh, very stark reminders of, of that. This was after a very long time that something like this happened. And I happened to be here. So personally speaking, uh, it was, uh, it, it, at this time, because things are different now, we have, we have a very different relationship with the world. We have a very different relationship via internet and also circumstantially, I mean, personally speaking, what one was as a child or how how the political landscape was and how we are today. Uh, when I am here today, the the reaction that comes out is, is concern you ways. One being the fact that uh, that uh, in in the list of priorities, ethnicity and division of ethnicity should not be, you know, anywhere in, so, that, in so, that order. So, so, so Mr. Lingdo, that's mm. what uh, all <coughs> thought. Things are different now. Probably, probably those were the things of the past, be it 79, 84, 87, 92, we keep on repeating that. But we all thought things are different now. But what happened in Sweeper Colony or the Motfran area, does this prove that notion wrong? Or, is it, or will it be exaggeration uh, to define it in such a way? I would say that this is not at all a communal clash. Mm. <clears throat> I would not term it a communal clash at all. This is, uh, there was an altercation between two sections, okay? Some who were going to fetch water and the other party was in a bus. What transpired, I'm not a party to, uh, but there was an altercation. Uh, this altercation was resolved when they went to the police, police station. station. But other vested interests then stepped into the picture. It's, it's very, very unfortunate because I think this whole thing is a battle about space. 
you know you have the mazhabi sikhs who who stay there and uh, they want to hold on there and then you have because shillong is growing there's a lack of space on the other side you have uh, the 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 hawkers who immediately stepped into the picture and they were the ones who did not allow the compromise to take place and they aggravated the issue uh, there's talk that uh, they see themselves occupying that place once the sikhs are removed and they see themselves occupying that place as a hawkers market there's there's that talk then of course uh, it this issue has been further complicated by i believe uh, uh, people who have sponsored this whole agitation <coughs> because uh, evidence is there that uh, the mob that came there was brought there brought so so it's not that they, it was not uh, something that that happened on the spur of the moment okay it was well thought of and uh, in fact uh, there are evidence that the mob was fed they were given food they were given water they were given other things now who is behind that who who is the one who sponsored so, it so on one hand you have like i said you have the the hawkers association then you have the land mafia which would like who would like to take that land and and keep it for themselves then you have uh, our petty politics that goes on here where people in the opposition want to you know earn brownie points against the so so it's basically a battle for land basically a battle for land it, it, uh, however yeah, exactly. kid, 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 do you think every effort was made uh, allegedly made by a certain section to turn it into a communal clash well, i think there are various reasons why this happened uh, you have what uh, mr rj has shared just now you have that element of truth but you also have that element of truth where you know uh, you, you have uh, people who have experienced things in the past and this has you know sort of boiling and been boiling and then it has reached a point where it kind of explodes it's like a dormant volcano but uh, but having said that uh, you know i see that the consequence of the absence of you know um, uh, governance systems i'm not blaming one government or because Successive you look at the traditional governance or you look at the mainstream governance the absence of systems and i think we've taken things for granted you know we've not really taken care of a piece of paper write, written it down signed the patas and all of that you know so i think uh, this is a lesson for all of us i'm talking about various communities in shillong and of course the government and of course non government organizations and people from across the board to be uh, to be wise you know and exercise wisdom and be careful in all these things however i also see that people should let's still talk about rights but also talk about well being because there's a difference between the two uh, i'm thinking about the well being of the children of shillong i'm not just talking about one or two communities so and all, all of those has to be within the parameters of reasoning because history has taught us you know uh, you look at this place or anywhere in the world that violence and agitations of you know that has some violent element in it has never 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 ever worked whether we like it or not and peace is the only solution i mean it's very difficult to talk about peace it's difficult for you know even for me to make peace with my how, with, how, with my how, father my my yeah, son yeah. but you know that's the only solution that's the only way forward however mr bhattacharya one thing is certain whatever happened in the mothfran or the sweeper colony uh, it didn't have an open o- overnight there was angst there was anger there was fear whatever you term it and it got expression it got expression after that incident so isn't it also the failure of the successive district administrations also the traditional bodies who who could have done probably much better to avoid such a situation and i am not saying immediately over the years a lot of things must have gone wrong for which we come to this point as i have already said in my opening statement that this is not an new issue but we tend to brush everything under the carpet when things become normal and then we forget about it now the question is irrespective of what are the reasons how it emanated 
how it erupted. But you will all, my fellow panelists, will agree that the soft targets ultimately becomes the non-indigenous community, which, as I would draw a parallel, that like we have, say, for example, the Ram Mandir issue in UP, here we have the non-tribal issue. Everyone aspiring to become into the political fraternity, this is a very, very convenient issue to take up to come to the limelight. Would you, would you agree with that, Reverend Basimat? The soft target eventually is the quote-unquote non-tribal here. I was thinking on that line, uh, but I, I'm looking at the, uh, what you call them as Harijan, but outside Shillong we see Dalit. Okay, and I think they don't like the word Harijan also, which Gandhi gave them. Yeah. But Dalit. Now we have, what I'm proposing is that uh, we need to have a Dalit tribal interface. Let's not take the whole non-tribal issue as Professor yeah. Naba has said. Let, let's particularize this. The issues of the Dalits in Meghalaya and the issues of the tribals. Now we all, at the All India level, we have a, a Dalit tribal forum. And I have been part of that to take up the issues of both the Dalit uh, issues, the Dalit problems, as well as the tribal problems, and the tribals in the fifth schedule area, the tribals in the sixth schedule area, and we take them up annually with the, with the government. Now, if, if at this level, local level, if we can have a, a Dalit tribal interface, and I'm, then we can particularize. Now, I've been talking to Bengalis, allow me to expand a little bit. And then, uh, because for the Khasi, Every Bengali is a foreigner. Now, so it attaches, you know, it becomes a chain reaction. Now, I've been talking to the Bengalis who have been living here for 200 years. Now, they also, the issue of space is there. Now, it doesn't mean that they, they want a, a Bangladeshi Bengali to, to, to get what he, who's here. And the Bengali in Shillong, he feels himself more superior than the Bengali in Calcutta. Am I right? I have experienced that from my own friends from uh, Calcutta. So what we need to, we have to do a little bit of a social, uh, social analysis. We go deep to get out the roots because 25 years back it was a Khasi Nepali. 1979 it was a Khasi Bengali. Now it is a Khasi uh, Dalit. Now, so the subject may change, the target may change. change. So to get into this, we need to do a kind of a socio-economic analytical study on this matter so that we can really make Shillong an island of peace. And peace, rights is for, uh, those of us who are involved in rights, is that we go for peace. And we are talking about uh, peace, a community peace. Not only your self-peace, but a community peace, not only social so, peace. So, so, so basically more interactions required between communities. On this note, we'll take a very short break. Don't go anywhere. Lot more coming on on the other side. Welcome back. You're watching this special episode of Beyond the Bites. We're in Shillong today discussing the current situation and what's the way forward to bring in permanent peace. Well, just before going to the break, Reverend Basai Mathia said that more interactions between communities is the need of the hour. Uh, Mr. Bhattacharji would like to add on to that. Yeah, I fully agree with the, what uh, Reverend Basai Math has said regarding interaction. But you see, when I'm a third generation here. We have that time when we were in school and college, and I think we are flogging that uh, 79 thing too much. I, I don't know whether my other panelists agree or not. See, we need to move. 79 happened, there are deep wounds, but some writers, some people keep opening that wound. You see, we have moved ahead. Maybe other issues have happened, but we had a community, like uh, Bob, uh, Kong Agnes, we belong to uh, 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 um, an era and come from a place where we did not have this feeling who is Khasi, who is Bengali, who is Bihari. We grew up in that atmosphere from our childhood. Without going into what are the causes which can be uh, taken up, I would like to say that the non-indigenous community has also 
contributed a lot, whether you say in the field of education, together working hand in hand with the contribution made by the missionaries. In the realm of education, healthcare, the, the Bengalis, since Reverend Basayama mentioned, that contribution had been there, but things changed. And now what has happened? Quality has been raised by quantity. You see, that is what has been happening. The people with dignity, self-respect, they thought that it's better to walk out. But I think that is not the right approach if you become but is an that, is that is that is that a matter of concern even for the indigenous people of Shillong? Just the point that he made, Mr. Bhattacharjee made right now. See, let me, let me just say one thing. Uh, 79 and all those problems that happened. Uh, the thing is that I think we, as a, as, as, as a Shillong society, uh, we just swept everything under the carpet, you know, and we did not give a proper closure to it all. Right. And I think that is wrong. Right, right. You know, because unless there's a proper closure, the wound will always fester. Right, right. That's, we have, that's, we, we that's have a, to be able, yeah. we have to be able to take it out from under the carpet now and find the proper closure for it all. See, this this thing about about uh, the the clash between locals and non-locals is not happening only in Shillong. Hmm. I mean, you, Shillong is a city that I mean is a place that became a city. I think in the last maybe thirty years. Before that, it was a town, and before that, it was a collection of villages. Hill station. Yeah, it was a collection of villages. It was not even a city. It became, it became a city over Absolutely. two decades, two and a half decades ago. Then that's when it became a city. But if you look at a place like Mumbai, hmm. which has been a city for maybe a, a, a century, or maybe more than a century, it's become a, it, so, it has so, been a city. So, so, One minute. Yeah. There also, there is still ethnic clashes. You still have the Marathis yeah, who say, this is mine, right. get out everybody who is non-Marathi. This is something that, you know, is not, I mean, happening only in Shillong. It's there everywhere. But the thing is, we have to address it. We have to address it. You see, once we've become a city, the economy has gone up. And with the economy going up, more and more people who support that economy has been coming in. You know, we cannot expect that as locals, we will take over the economy and we will do everything. I don't think it works like that. You know, if we try to, to get into business on reservations, the business is never going to, do, to work. You know, look at what has happened in the past. If you look at the clash, after the clash with the, with the, with the uh, Nepalis and Biharis, a lot of locals went into rearing cattle. But they did not know how, how to start it, how to do it. What happened? It all collapsed. Similarly, <clears throat> after the last clash, you know, a lot of Marwaris went away and left their businesses. Immediately, locals took over those businesses, but they did not sustain because they don't know how. Whereas, if you look at earlier generations, whether it's the, you, you look at all the big business people of of uh, of Shillong, whether it's Ba Tabung, whether it's Ba Khran, whether it's Ba Shro, Ba Amor. Oh. <clears throat> they all started as small, Kong Elibon, mm -hmm. they all started as small people and they worked with non-local uh, business people and they learned the trade from there. And after they've learned the trade, then they were able to stand on their own feet and they were able to sustain their business. You see, there are no shortcuts. There are no shortcuts. We have to admit that. There are no shortcuts. If we want to get into business, we have to learn the business first. Throwing out somebody and then taking over the business and expecting it to sustain doesn't work. So are you saying because there is space, because there is space, because there is need, economy is booming, so people are coming in, Kit, how do we handle that? Because there is a genuine rising concern against influx, quote unquote influx. So, so economy is booming, can we stop people from coming in? It's a global age. If not, how do we handle this? Well, I see uh, that as an internal and external problem, and uh, you know, internally because, uh, like I said in the in the pre previously about the systems in place, uh, you look at the Japanese model, or you look at the Singaporean model, you know, where they have really uh, been able to uh, go on because whatever they've done in terms of 
uh, you know, safeguarding the rights and the, you know, think about their well-being is always from a protection perspective, not from a fear perspective. So, uh, you know, once we react in fear, then, you know, then reasoning just vanishes. It, it, it vanishes. So, I think protection uh, goes along with your reasoning. And then it, 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 it uh, you know, propels you and initiates you to actually work every day. Now, uh, peace returns, we stop working because peace will not happen overnight or over a period of five years. Now, we've said 79, how many years has gone? You know, we've not put closure to that. So, I think it has to be a constant, you know, relook, relooking at things, um, peace building exercise, starting from, you know, school no, children, no, no, engaging no. school yeah. children. For example, my son, he has, his close friend is, uh, a Punjabi boy. They share tiffin and they, you know, whenever, uh, you know, the Punjabi boy needs uh, his pencil to be sharpened, then, uh, you know, my boy would go and do that. To them, it doesn't make sense. He is six, my daughter is eight. When he said curfew is imposed, they asked me, why, what, what is this? You know, so I, I think we should learn from them because to them, social interface becomes too very natural. So how do we go back, you know? So again, from Everything that we do has to be perhaps from the perspective from the perspective of protection, not not fear. Not fear. But Can I say one thing? Yeah. Can I say one thing? See, I'll just take I'll just take on from where uh, Reverend Basio Mott had said. You know, what has happened since these different conflicts that have happened in in Shillong City? Instead of motivating communities to come out and start working with each other, yeah. what happened was it drove communities into themselves. And they segregated themselves from each other. Okay? Well, once you isolate yourselves, then there is no communication. If there is no communication, but then, but one then, minute. Yeah. If there is no communication, then there is no understanding. Mm. If there is no understanding, then suspicion comes up. And once suspicion starts coming up, then a small rumor can blow things out right, of proportion. Right, right. Right. And right. there is no relationship. Exactly. Right, right. I think what we need to do now is understand that instead of <coughs> building walls around ourselves, instead of going inwards like uh, crabs or snails, I think the time has come for us to come out. Let's, let's use this as an opportunity to come out of each our, our own communities, stretch out to other communities and learn to understand each other and learn to, to trust each other and learn to work with each other. That was there in the past. Why can't it be there now? But then, but then have not successive governments failed in this? You need to build that trust. Why do people go into their own shells? There must be a reason. There is mistrust. Why the mistrust? Why are you saying the government has to build the trust? It's not a government's job it's to do that. Job it's, it's community's job. What we need to do, as I said earlier, we need to have a community interface. See, exactly. I'll, I'll tell you where it is coming no, from. Let let's, let's take See. the incident at hand. Let's take the Motfran incident at hand. It all started with stone pelting. The government could not contain the situation for three three to four days the army had to be called in had it taken timely action that is one that but is one line of that is one line please yeah, understand ahead. one thing yes now you are saying that the government did not did not take the right steps i would say i would look at it from the other point of view now these these agitators were not from the areas where the agitation happened they were not from mokhar they were not from jayao they were not from wathabru they were not from lamagala they, they were people who had come from outside and when you say that you know, soft targets, I think the people of Maukhar and Jayao became the soft targets. Hmm. Every time a stone was thrown, it did not hit the agitators, it hit the houses, the residences of the people from there. When a canister of, of uh, tear gas blew, the agitators ran away. But that tear gas went into the houses. It's the children inside that house, the old people inside that house who suffered. They were the soft targets. You see? Can now, we add here? Again, again, I would, I would still come back to the question, why are people forced to go into their shells? I still haven't got answer to the question. Yes, Mr. Bhattacharya. You see, here again, you have to go to the genesis. Overnight, you cannot say that you start building bridges. It has mm -hmm. to be a process which has, is a dynamic process which has to evolve from the communities involved themselves. You see, the majority, while the majority community has to look after the interests of the minorities. At the same time, the minority communities who are here, they also have a responsibility towards the welfare and interest of the majority communities. There is a lot of talk going on that the Khasi community as such, like Bob said, 
the Rangbashnongs, the Senkinte, the Senklongme of these areas, Jayao and all, they were not listened to. They mm. were forced to retreat to their homes. Mm. They were not allowed, the, 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 the mob that time were not willing to uh, listen to, li listen to uh, them. They wanted that sense should prevail. If Khasis were communal, how come such lacks of uh, non-indigenous, non-Khasis had settled here? I would give you an example. Khasis are basically emotional. We are interfacing, I as an individual, I go all over the state. I am fighting for the rivers of the state. I have filed cases. I am fighting for the Wamkra and Umshirpi, the river system, the social systems. I am in the sports fraternity. I am leading the sports fraternity. We go to Nongstoin. We take our boys from here. We get boys, boys from Nongstoin to Mokarwat. So the minority communities also should come forward. And that fear should go. At the same time, the majority also should not take, like Reverend Basai Moit says, that you see any non-tribal that he is either from Bangladesh, he is an infiltrator. That, that attitude also should go. So last two decades, this, this was being narrowed down. So even the minorities, that escapist policy will not do. That summers I come, winters I go and things. No, you need to uh, come forward. And I do not subscribe to the view that Khasis are xenophobic in that manner. It may be happen, they're emotional. Uh, what was the xenophobia when Amit Pal, lakhs of people came out, Molai, people like me were garlanded. You see, they, they, it happens, but it was not sustained. Mm. And we need to identify who, which and who are the forces. Today, mm. we are in a global village. Things have all moved out. People are moving out. You see in the social media, people, our children who are studying outside, they are also writing that how should we take this uh, forward and not create a situation which was there persisting earlier. So to build this, we need to come forward everyone so this is this is the no essence of but, this but thing. but again 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 despite all this despite all this uh, the fear how less how small it might be it still persists See, no of course it does. it's the fear yes. that has driven communities inwards is this fear but is this fear real should we fear each other should we all the time be dominated and controlled by fear I think that is wrong. That, that is what is causing all these problems. I think we have to overcome this fear. See, um, a guy like Naba has integrated into the society. He married a Khasi. And I think they, they're having a very good life together. I don't think there's any communal problems adjusting within their family. So they, and just like him, there are many others who have integrated. There's been intermarriages and all that. And I don't think... The fact that they're from different communities has come in, into, uh, come in between their relationship at all. They have healthy family lives. They've been growing. And if they can do it, why can't others do it? I don't understand that. You but see, again, uh, yeah. to say that the government will, will do it, I, don't, I think it's wrong. But again, but again, we have to take the but lead. Again, it's we, we, we tend to hide behind pluralism, communities. In, I'm indigenous and you wait for somebody else to do it. You're never willing to do it yourself. And that is why it takes time. Also to touch upon difficult topics that have not been addressed, you know, like it's easy to say that we have stretched 79. But if it comes up, if people are afraid, the thing is that if this is a time, forget why this whole writing happened, etc. If this is a time for something, I think it's, it's a good time for us because we're already talking about these things that you know we begin to uh, to just you know things happen in phases in any culture in any country where atrocities have happened you know even in germany wherever there is a phase of acknowledgement after which it automatically begins to dissipate you know that trust begins to come when you have sort of gone through the cycle of admitting that there was something Absolutely. in you know, fact uh, as uh, mr lingo has just mentioned 79, 84, 82, 87, whatever needs a proper closing. Uh, would you like to uh, elaborate more on that? What Sorry. would be a proper closing for you? And yeah. uh, I would also like uh, Reverend Basayamad to come in. First and foremost, what we need to do is 
show that we are willing to rally between the Amit Paul, behind Amit Pauls who come into the picture. Right. Can we find some more Amit Pauls? Can we find some more rallying points where communities from different, uh, I mean, uh, people from different communities could come and join hands and, and, and uh, support that person? I think we need more of that. Our politics has been, unfortunately, a very, a very divisive politics. You know, we, we've, we've followed the British style. It hasn't gone away. You know, we're still suffering from that colonial hangover where our politics is a very divisive politics. In fact, it's divisive not only between communities, but even within the denominations. Come election time, denominations start coming up. Then, beyond, if it's within the denomination, then they look at clans. Then, so it's, it, it, it keeps on dividing itself. So, politics will not give you an answer. Some social causes will give us an answer. We've been rallying behind the, the Shillong Chamber Choir. Can we all come, can we can we bring down have an occasion where we all come out together and and, 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 and do, find some reason. reason find reasons for us to come out and hold hands and support some each Absolutely. other Absolutely reasons reasons to come together uh, on that note we'll take another short break don't go anywhere Welcome back, you're watching Beyond the Bites, we're in Shillong today. Well, uh, before going to the break, uh, Mr. Lindo was saying how the communities need more reasons to come together. Now, uh, Kit, uh, what about the paradox of the average Khasi youth? Employment opportunity, opportunities are dwindling, yeah. the population is growing. He sees quote-unquote outsiders coming in. He mm. feels his job has been taken away. Mm. His business ventures are being mm. uh, tried by somebody else. Mm. So, so what is the way forward? What should be his mode of thinking so as to maintain a communal harmony throughout? I'm not saying that there is no communal harmony. But then, again, the socio-economic factor plays a major role and we mm. cannot deny that. Mm. I think from my experience, because I come from a uh, you know locality where curfew has been imposed, and even now I have another two hours to I have to get there. So uh, I, I I feel uh, the the sentiments of the people, and uh, some of those sentiments are, are very uh, you know very important. So you to, think the fear is grounded, if I can call it a fear at all? Uh, I think it's a mix of fear. But uh, coming back to your question, I think uh, that as a background, and coming to your question. Uh, you know, you have um, a, an average Khasi youth. If that young person or person of any age is uh, sound uh, economically, has a job, or whether it's his job, I mean his own uh, initiative or it's a employee of some organization or government, he's okay and he will not really very unlikely go into the forefront of all of this thing. But uh, but I think the problem is, as a community, we have to evolve. I've, ha I've had a chance to be part of a capacity, uh, human supporting capacity uh, project. Uh, uh, you know, so I, I know the psyche of the average Jews, because and this unionized mentality. I'm using those words because we tend to over depend on government and government jobs. Absolutely. In fact, for everything that happens, even now, we tend to blame. I'm not. I'm very, very apolitical, but we tend to blame the government for everything. We think that the government can solve everything. It's God and the devil at one given moment, you know. So, uh, I, I, I think, you know, I'll give you an example. If I am 50 year old uh, and then I have a 25 year old son and he's, he, he's, he's, he's into business of farming, it could be poultry. I will have the attitude that, okay, he will do, if you ask me, what is my son doing? I will have the attitude saying that, okay, he's doing something until he gets a job. By saying he gets a job, which means that he gets a government, a government job. job. I mean, 32 lakhs, which is 3.2 million people, there are f about uh, 52,000 uh, government uh, you know, employees. Now, that is say, about 1.92%. It's, it's a very small door, you know. So, I think. We have to come around and then parents have to be educated and we have to talk about this. It's India has moved ahead, you know. So we have to, you know, get out from this unionized mentality which we inherit probably from Bengal or erstwhile Assam or Kerala. 
Tripura is still uh, there, but you know, I, I think we have to get out of this and start to believe in ourselves, you know. And positively, as positively speaking, we have seen that evolution. We have seen how uh, a local boy or a local girl have taken up, you know, courage to start something, stand on their own feet. People have done it before, we have named those people, but I think we also have to support these young ones that, you know, have. No, start no, come no, no, Can no. I say one yeah, thing? Yeah, go ahead. See, I, I, let, let's understand when you when we talk about the government coming in, I think here is where the government has to come in. You know, you have to have an education policy that will not encourage people to migrate from rural to urban areas. Nowadays, our education policy encourages people to migrate from rural to urban areas. What happens then? Then you have a fight for urban jobs. Whereas the rural economy is in a slump because all the brains are coming away from the, from the rural areas. Can we reverse this? Can we have an education policy? Can we have a support system for entrepreneurs to go into the rural areas, set up businesses in the rural areas, build up that rural economy so that people do not need to migrate to urban areas? I think that is the first thing that we have to do. Now, what, what has happened in this present situation? We have unemployed youth who have come from the rural areas looking for jobs in, in the city. They can't get any good jobs. They're all having menial jobs, either as laborers or as handyman of the buses or as, as uh, porters. And even, for and, that, and even for that, they have to compete. Yeah, they're, they're, there's they have massive to compete. competition. There's massive competition. So there's a lot of frustration. And that frustration gets manifested in these... Uh, uh, Unhealthy ways. Absolutely. Even yeah. within the Mazabi community, Mazabi Paja. You look, the, the previous generation maybe had come here to be Safai people. But then the new generation has grown. They are educated. They attended the best of schools. Their expectations are there. But now you are suffocating that as expectation. So obviously there is a frustration there as well. So can, so we find, can we find a way out for this frustration? So has this has this again become another point of conflict between between the indigenous and the non-indigenous youth? Because with government jobs not sufficient, uh, youths are looking to private jobs. And as we see, most of the private jobs, uh, 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 if, if 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 I say people from outside, quote unquote outside, are into the private jobs. So there may be a common feeling, a general feeling that outsiders are again taking away the jobs. Does this become another issue that needs to be dealt with immediately? Yes, I feel that uh, there is that tension also where the everyone has said about the, uh, the boiling point. So that day the turnout was the boiling point and the frustration. Many of them did not uh, expect also because uh, yes, uh, yesterday one journalist told me, he said while he pretended, he hid his camera and pretended to give water to those uh, thing because he didn't want them the stones coming to him he said he suddenly heard one of the boys the stone pelters saying this government is okay we would have been shot you know that was the thing that you know they came out to uh, show their frustration but in that frustration also they realized something was there but in like you said uh, there also the gov i feel the government has made laws and there, should, there are laws and rules where certain uh, positions, are, I mean certain posts are to be regulated and uh, even the unorganized sector has to be looked into where yes the local boys also the local thing can be uh, accommodated with consideration for the other communities also. Your, your views on that Mr. Charge? You see, they, I don't think there is much of a uh, conflict regarding the jobs in the unorganized sector. As far as the non-indigenous is concerned, white collar jobs or any government job is ruled out because of the reservation policy. Absolutely. Number two comes in the unorganized sector, business and all. You see, to be very candid, our own Khasi boys need to develop their dignity of labor because there are certain kind of job which they are unwilling to do. And this they have picked up from the people from Bengal and Assam. I want a white collar job, I want a 10,000, they will <coughs> fix that I need 20,000, otherwise 5,000. Oh, tang sana jar, oh, long dead. 
this type of mentality also is there among the youth. And I tell you this, the genesis of the present problem has 90% been on livelihood. They are all employed. And there is a reverse migration. Are you, I don't know, I'll tell you very clearly. There were about more than six to 700 boys Bob will agree with me, who were employed in the coal sector. Good of mining, bad of mining, I'm not going to that. So this is one sector where 1,600 to 1,000 boys were employed from Shillong, who have now come back. It is again a reverse migration taking place, and they are totally unemployed, frustrated. They don't know what to do because they are not willing to do certain kinds of jobs. And here I agree with Bob that this is where the government needs to step in. All our, unfortunately, I was also in many programs, all these skill development programs and other things are failure till date, I will tell you. Because you employ my boy, you get a company, you give him 24,000 rupees that you train my boy. And what they do, they take our boys and girls, pay for three months and they have to come back. This is worst case. Yes. You gave them the taste of three months, you give him five, five thousand rupees and then he or she has to come back here. At least our girls, so, they so, so, uh, so the government needs to revisit its skill development skill schemes, development how is it going other, ahead with uh, that? But uh, uh, we, we, we are running out of time very quickly, coming back to the core issue that we are discussing here today now. Uh, Looking at the brighter side of things, despite uh, uh, whatever might have been written uh, in the national media about the incidents uh, that uh, uh, happened in Shillong in the last week or so, we have to note that no precious life was lost. Uh, a lot of people are tagging it, uh, uh, you know, at par with 79 or 84 or 92, but then, then that, that's sheer exaggeration. However, however, we also noticed a number of uh, delegations, uh, especially from Punjab, uh, coming in, visiting the city one after another. Of course, we respect their concerns Absolutely. and there is nothing wrong with that. But having said that, uh, was a message being sent that there is a serious crisis going on in Shillong and that prompted those delegations to come here one after another to take stock of the situation? Definitely. Definitely. See, what has, as has been pointed out by the panelists, one of the reasons that aggravated this whole issue was false news, news, false information. And false information started going from both sides. Mm. On one side, you had people who claimed that the boys who had been beaten up had died. Right. Mm. On the other side, you have uh, claims that a person had been, had been raped, that, uh, that <laughs> a lot of confusion, lot, lots of wrong information Fusion. was going all over the place. One of the reasons why these delegations came from outside was because of the wrong information that they got. After they've come here, after they've seen the situation, there each and every one of them has said, each and every one of them has said, the picture is totally different from what I thought it was. They've all said that. Hmm. Which means that they got wrong information. You see, and I think insofar as, as uh, as bringing the peace now, I think we should do with minimum influence from outside. Right. Absolutely. I think it has Absolutely. to be solved from within. Uh, uh, I was this about is the our, state, this is the state should be capable ourselves. of handling, tackling its own issues. Uh, we are running yes. out of time. Last words, uh, no, uh, Reverend Basaymat, uh, what should be the way forward for Shillong from here on no. to maintain permanent peace? No, Very we quickly. We all have shared, and if we take all those bits and pieces yes. and put them together, and we can, let us prove to the world, we can solve ourselves Selves. the problems. That Absolutely. Mr. Bhattacharya, last this word is, from you. This is our problem. Let us solve it within us, where in our own intrinsic manner, which has been the culture of uh, Shillong, instead of outside interference. And I would add that within us also, we have people who become saviors of either the tribals or non-tribals. Absolutely, absolutely. Go, go and to, we have a, go we'll have a lot Delhi, of tales to tell. Go to Delhi and absolutely. try to take a absolutely. lot of accolades. Mm. Absolutely. I think this type of people should be exposed and let us sit together and we can solve right. this problem. We Last have the words, strength yes, and yes. Shillong has shown and we can overcome. Absolutely. Last words from you. Yeah, as Nava has said, we can bounce back yeah. and come back and we are always there. Any community, please reach out to us and please let us bring about peace. Your views? See, again, the thing is that uh, uh, the recognition of uh, 
national minority and a state minority, you know, being two different mm. subjects altogether. I think that's a very important first step. So within this, I think with all of this energy, you know, to take on this as a pilot project to show the way forward as to how, because we're a small community, we're a small space, it is possible to have this sort of healthy reconstruction of a of a good minority, very, majority very culture, good you know. Point, very good point you made know? there. Uh, last words for me, Mr. Lingdo. See, I believe that every crisis can become an opportunity for better things to happen. I think this present crisis can be the opportunity to really find closure for all the problems that have happened in the past. Absolutely. Find a closure for the problems of the past, find reasons to bring communities to come and work with each other. And I think, you know, boost up the rural economy, ensure that, you know, the migration from rural to urban areas is is somehow Absolutely. Uh, arrested. Multi-pronged approach, yeah. multi-pronged yeah. approach. It is, it is uh, a multi-dimensional problem. Together. It's Kit not a unidimensional problem. It's a multi-pronged problem. Absolutely. Problem. Kit, last words from you. I think we've overcome 79, we've overcome 87. You know, Shillong is a very strong city and we've got, a, you know, a strong voice of reasoning and that voice should come out even much more. And, um, yeah, resonate. And, 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 and if you look at this as, you know, as a sickness, it is sickness must be present for healing to take place. And I believe in that healing and peace is underway. Absolutely. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm an, I, I am an optimist, you know, so starting. So, so, yeah. so Shillong, Shillong can definitely overcome this. There are no two opinions, no two views about it. Uh, every crisis is an opportunity to make something constructive, to do something better. On this note, uh, we take your leave today. Do join us at the same time next week for yet another episode of Beyond the Bites. Till then, stay well, stay safe.